So our, our whole goal in this was to start a conversation, have a dialogue, if nothing else, just get together and 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 reconnect. I mean, coming to the AAN meetings ha has been such a wonderful way to connect in person, but we don't have that. So um, we wanted not an excuse, but we are like, okay, what can we talk about that everybody can participate in? So. Um, I encourage everyone to please, please join in, join in the conversation, and um, we'll um, just had a few topics to talk about, but um, want to, we all learn together when we can share. So that's really important. So thank you all for attending this. And we're going to keep it on time. Lucy and Allison will keep, can you keep us, rein us in? You're used to doing this a lot, <laughs> all of us. So. So thank you everyone for, um, for reaching out and, and joining us today. All right, so Peggy, as we talked about, I was just gonna, since this is a brand new consortium as we talked about, um, just gonna give a little, ba little bit of background on, <clears throat> on the reporting structure, how we um, you know, connect through the Academy and what that means. So, um, here are some information on the on three consortia, consortiums that we have that's under the graduate education realm. I understand for our consortium, the Consortium for Neurology Education Coordinators, it not only includes um, residency um, coordinators, but that we have our fellowship and also our clerkship coordinators. When we were think, you know, putting our heads together to figure out how to create this consortium, it really didn't make sense to have three separate groups, and you know that we do have you know um, like information across the board, and so it just made sense from a, from an academy perspective to have one group, um, and we just have it reporting right now to the graduate education subcommittee. But we do have you know continued conversations with our undergraduate subcommittee and our pipeline subcommittee just to make sure that we're connected and and stay stay in the loop with what's happening in in those arenas. <clears throat> but just from a reporting standpoint. As I said, there's three consortiums. Um, the other two are related to residents and fellows, and we do have one for program directors. All three of those consortiums report to the graduate education subcommittee, so they oversee and provide direction on, um, you know, projects, uh, questions, what have you, to these consortiums. Um, any work that needs to be approved, or just, you know, um, as far as you know, if there's a manuscript, for example. Um, creation of a new pr uh, product or you know project we kind of run it by the GES to get their input. Peggy does sit on the graduate education subcommittee since the, she's the chair of the consortium. All three of the consortiums have officers. They have three of them, the chair, chair elect and the past chair and we um, convene with those folks on a regular basis to make sure we're in the, um, you know having continued conversations and know um, how to move forward with the work that's needed for, for our various constituents. The graduate education subcommittee then reports to our education committee. They're the overarching group that, as I mentioned, it's graduate, undergraduate, there's pipeline. We look at um, some non-neurology non um, information. So the education committee is, is, has a broader purview. They also over, oversee our conferences, which is in relation to our annual meeting and our regional programming. Um, and also we have an e-learning subcommittee that reports to our, to our education uh, committee. And so, um, the education committee then in turn reports to a board of directors. And so depending on what the work is and the, you know, um, what needs approval, there's various ways that um, it doesn't necessarily need to go all the way up to the board of directors, for example, it just depends on what the project is or, or what the work is that needs to be done. So that's just a high level overview. As I mentioned, each, each of the consortiums have the officers and those are who we work through to get the work of the consortium completed and, and on track. Um, for each of the consortiums, we do have and create work groups within those. And Peggy and Chris and I have been in conversation along with Allison to talk through what, um, based on the survey that you all completed, what, how, what's the direction we need to head um, as far as work groups. And so we'll be sending, that, sending out that information here shortly um, as to the groups we convened and get those groups moving in, in, in the direction that we need as far as projects. Um, next slide, Allison. I wanted to touch base a bit on what our annual meeting programming looks like. As you all know, our annual meeting is virtual this year, as most meetings are at this time of the year. We made the decision to be completely virtual. And so I just wanted to highlight a few of the programming that's specific to you 
or um, your colleagues or constituents. And so um, our next, or not our next, but our, our business meeting, and that's relation to the annual meeting, if we were meeting in person, we would obviously have an in-person meeting. But we're doing this virtually in April and um, on April 6th and that from 1 to 2.30 Central. We're going to work on the agenda, get some input from you on what you want to hear about. Um, we have our coordinator programming that we, for those that remember last year, we had, gosh, a day and a half of programming set aside for coordinators over, you know, the beginning of the meeting because we um, wanted to still continue with that. We are able to Again, with, with us being in a virtual space, there's limited time on the platform for to have all programming, but we were given three spots. Um, and so we worked with Chris and, and Peggy to, to understand what the three uh, programming was that needed to, again, for um, residency fellowship and clerkship coordinators. And so we, can't, we are uh, able to offer these three uh, uh, courses, I would call them, over the, these, these uh, days at the annual meeting. The clerkship and program director conference is, as most of you know, um, there's content that's related to coordinators um, as part of that conference. Um, so I put that on here so you're aware of what, when that is. The program director, program director business meeting has not yet been scheduled. Once that's been scheduled, we'll communicate that to you. It will also be virtual, obviously. Probably in April, we need to pick a date and time for that also. We'll communicate that to you. For those that remember, we have the training and faculty networking. It is a reception that we call it. It's usually the Monday night of the meeting. Um, this year, we're, we're trying to figure out what that event look, looks like. Obviously, it's not going to be a reception, but we're trying to figure out, as you recall, we have posters as part of that. They're program posters. And so you have the opportunity to tell students and residents and fellows about your residency program or your fellowships. Um, and your clerkships, clerkships can talk about their, their information also. And so we will have posters. We're trying to figure out from our platform vendor what that looks like, how long we can have it. Um, we've been told right now it'll be six months available post meeting. So we're just trying to figure out the details and trying to figure out what are the components around that night that we would have that if, if for example, we're able to have the posters over six months, how can we you know, have activities around that? So trying to figure out what all that means. And then as some of you know, we have a trainee trivia game that we've offered, gosh, I think eight times now monthly over the past few months. Um, Allison spearheads that. And so last night was our most recent game. Our next one is scheduled for March 16th. Um, we're also planning one for the annual meeting. It'll probably be the Wednesday. We're waiting on a on confirmation on that, but this has been real, really well attended primarily by our residents and fellows and across the world. We've had folks join from, you know, um, Korea, um, different you know countries across the world. So it's it's really um, been a way for residents to connect. It and it is education. They do you know it, they do um, get a lot of uh, out of it. And there is follow up after that. They communicate with our uh, hosts on just to get some additional. So just wanted to highlight that as far as um, in our programming schedule. Now this is not the only thing that's happening at the meeting that would be of interest to you. As I said, I just wanted to highlight a few things. If you go on our annual meeting page of our program page, there are lots of other things in relation to our um, experiential learning areas in relation to wellness, um, you know, other opportunities. But I just wanted to highlight a few things here that, you know, might be of interest and, and encourage you to, to go to the website to find more information on other things that are being offered. All right, next slide, Allison. <clears throat> I wanted to take the opportunity since you know um, you're here and can help get the word back to our trainees and to your directors. We do have on, on the 19th is a deadline for a lot of our annual meeting scholarships and what is called our director mentorship leadership program. And so, you know, we sent emails and um, you know that sort of stuff, letting them know about these opportunities. But I just wanted to um, utilize this opportunity to make you aware and, and if you can remind these folks about these opportunities, we would appreciate that. Next slide, Allison. So again, as far as AAM staff contacts, that would be me and Allison as your primary contact. So we're here to field any questions that you might have in relation to the consortium, to the academy in general, um, we are your points of contact. So with that, um, I don't know if you wanted to ask if anybody had any questions before you jumped into your portion. Yeah, so did anyone have any questions? I saw something come up on the, the chat a little bit. Um, let's see here. 
just go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Um, I think Susan Grice had a question. Yeah, so I have to submit a request to even attend and I have to put, so are we getting, do we have to pay this year? And if so, like do, um, like when we were in person, we got a lower cost for the coordinator sessions. Yeah, there so is a to cost to attend the meeting virtual regardless of, of, of a role and, um, you know, uh, member type. And so we can send that information out to you shortly here after this meeting to provide you with the link to that to the registration information. But okay. um, again, with it being virtual, our biggest cost is, the, an, or is, is our AV cost because we do have to pay, pay for the platform in order to host these meetings. And so there is a cost that's um, being associated with the meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, for the poster session that we usually do, um, so you don't have a date set aside for that when that's going to take place? Will it take place during the meeting or is that going to be something I kind of missed what you said? Oh, yeah, no problem, Clara. Yeah, we're, it is going to be offered, but it's not going to be just one day of the meeting. It'll be available for the duration of the meeting. And the posters right now, what we're discussing with the vendor is to make it available for six months post meeting. So um, you, it, what we're trying to do is figure out what for the posters we can do as part of the meeting, you know, the days of the meeting, um, what are those engagement things, but also six months post, you know, if it's available, then how are, what are some things we can still continue to make folks aware of, trainees aware of, and what does that continued conversation looks, look like? So it will be offered, but not, not just one day of the meeting, it's throughout the meeting, and then our hope is at least six months after the meeting. And also an portion to have either one on one or an interactive session so that you can still connect with those uh, potential residents and fellows because it, I love that event. It's always such a great place to meet those people um, before they ever apply so and start the dialogue and the relationship. So they're trying to trying to figure all of that out how that's going to look and, and what's going to be the best use of time and actually really have the same impact. Mm -hmm. So uh, more information will come on that. Absolutely. All right, so I think we're to the discussion portion here. Um, one of the one of the a, a topic where we could all talk together and just have com, conversation and just share with what's what's going on, what's worked for you, what's nothing, you know, what hasn't worked. Um, so I just want to open it up and and talk about staying connected in a virtual world. Um, if someone has this, like you know, I learned so much from you guys. So. Um, somebody wants to start the conversation and, and what maybe um, has worked for them or just an, an insight on something about staying connected in a virtual world. Don't be shy. But I can start calling on people that I know. No, I'm kidding. Um, so yeah. uh, go ahead, go ahead, Michelle. Yes, um, I can't imagine, um, I'm, I'm, I'm working under the assumption that at least 80% of us are probably working from home. Um, and uh, it's been almost a year for us, we're in Connecticut, so the Eastern Coast has been pretty closed down since St. Patrick's Day of last year. Um, so literally we're um, coming up on a year and it's very challenging. One thing that I find helps um, in terms of staying connected, at least with the residents and um, our group, is I have weekly meetings with uh, my program director, even if it's 15 minutes on the fly, and even if it's FaceTime in between patients, uh, I find that to be really helpful. We do have our, uh, a resident meeting with our residents at least once a month. Um, I don't know if many of you do that, but I do find that to be really helpful. Um, I will say that the virtual recruiting caused an incredible amount of anxiety for all of us. I know I was very anxious, but I was really, really remarkably pleased by how well it went. Um, and I'd be curious to hear how it went for other people. It went far beyond my expectations in so many ways. 
um, and I can show reasons for that. But um, and staying connected with, uh, I have a lot of fellowship coordinators that I work with, so I try to reach out to them um, as often as possible. And one of the things we're trying to do a little less of is email um, and texting. And sometimes we'll just call or FaceTime each other when we have a question or a need. It's kind of like you would just go and visit them in their office uh, or their workspace. So I find that that's helpful, trying to do a little bit more of that to stay connected with people in addition to sort of the monthly, weekly meetings. Um, and the other thing that uh, we have like a phone offend program for on the wellness side for our residents and we're starting to do that for our coordinators here at Yale as well because we find that people are disconnected, we're losing pieces of information that are important and as we get into the whole appointment process and uh, visa process, uh, we're going to lose people if we're um, going to be working from home until the summer. So we need to make sure that um, there's more face to face. So those are just a couple of things that have been helping us. I'd love to hear what other people have to say. Yeah, um, we're going to have a little bit later. Um, we've got a couple of people are going to lead a discussion about recruitment. So hold your recruitment uh, conversation for a little bit later. But what else have you discovered? What else? I've missed you guys. I don't know. You know, it's funny. I miss that that connection with other coordinators and just even it here, you know, on site. And I've been on site most of the time just because I've had other people in the department that have small children and they've been able, they had to do the cool, had to do the school thing remotely. So I don't have, I have my resident who are my children, right? I, and I, so I actually volunteered to come in as much as I, I you know, I, I could. So we were never ever shut down from that perspective. I now take a COVID test every week and um, I just have my second vaccine. So in a couple of weeks, I'll have to stop doing that. I won't have to do that anymore. So what else? What's been working? What hasn't? I would say um, on the other side of that, I'm a new coordinator. I just started with our program in August. Um, so with everything being virtual, I wasn't able to build those relationships with with my resident not on a on a person to person because a lot of them don't turn their camera on so for the first couple of weeks I didn't know what some of them looked like <laughs> um so if I saw them in the hallway because I'm on I'm on campus if I saw them on the hallway then I wouldn't know that they belong to me and like you Peggy they're they're my kids too so um I think that's a, a big disadvantage when everything is virtual, you lack that one-on-one -on -one interaction with just them coming by the office and saying, hey, I'm so-and-so kind of thing. So for me, it was a, it was a bit, because it took me longer to meet all of them. Um, but now that we, you know, I mean, we have the meetings too, like Michelle does once a month. And our program director has made them has made them mandatory, and um, he's getting better at hey when we have meetings I need your camera on so we can, you know we can interact even if you're eating lunch I mean it feels more personable, without a black screen looking at you. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, Jennifer. We make ours turn their cameras on. Um, it's a requirement. It's it's they don't have an option during noon conference. Um, and it's just so we can have interaction. Some of the faculty were complaining, nobody speaks, nobody says anything. They all want to type everything. So we've, we've made them try to speak up and interact. Um, I know this generation is different. I prefer to pick the phone up and call somebody to get my answer. I don't want to have to email you um, to get my response, but that's the world we live in this day and age. So we're trying to make ours be a little more interactive, but we've all been here. We, um, those that are doing an elective can stay at home um, during that four weeks because we're on a block system, but uh, the rest of them have to come in. So, and we've all been vaccinated down here in Houston. And as you all know, we're struggling right now with no electric and no water in the city. So it's pretty challenging right now with COVID on top of it. <laughs> Andy, I like your I like your comment there. So, <laughs> do you want to talk about it? 
Yeah, it's 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 true. Once once I got a department credit card, everybody knew my name. Uh, so <laughs> I recommend it if you want to get to know them, but uh, if you want to stay hidden. <laughs> that one that one I just recently got, and um, because of everything, they haven't had any type of wellness event. So um, I agree with Andy now that they know that I'm the one with the money and the budget um, and can plan the wellness events. They've become my friends real quick. Hi, everyone. My name is Cassandra. I'm from the Medical University of South Carolina here in Charleston. And um, what we found to be very beneficial is actually to keep them in some type of normal routine. So like we would have lunch um, a couple of days out of the week and we would have breakfast a couple of days out of the week. And since they can't get together, we know that, you know, they still wanna, you know, feel that that um, fellowship went with their peers and kind of interact. So what we did or what I did was I begged caterers to, hey, can you pack everything individually? And they were like, no. I was like, well, you know, if it's a little extra, we good, we're good with it because we don't have that many in-house residents because the majority of them do them virtual. And uh, eventually I sweet talked them into, hey, look, pack everything individual, charge us a little bit extra, we're good with that, bring it to the loading dock because they couldn't get into the hospital. And so um, like when COVID first started, I was mandated to stay home that first week. And then once I found the secret entrance into the hospital, I started coming in. So, so when uh, the caterers would deliver the food, I would actually go down to the loading dock and pick it up so they wouldn't have to come in because they were afraid to come to the hospital for COVID as well. And so we had, um, we put the meals in a conference room. The residents would come get the meals that were individually packaged and then they would take it to the different various areas. And just like another coordinator said, they were made to um, have the cameras on because it was really hard for our program directors to interact with the residents with the cameras off and also with the um, faculty members that were leading the lectures because they would have the cameras off. And so you just like talking to a blank screen like I'm doing now. Uh, and so we didn't like have a lot of interaction, but um, as time progressed, they learned, you know, texting, FaceTime, keep the cameras on. And um, so far they've been doing really, really well. And so as our faculty, the ones that were able to use Zoom and learn how to use Microsoft Teams, but it was a challenge, but the, the whole routine of things and the structure being in place really, really helped a lot. Do you see attendance up on um, didactics because of um, it's on Zoom now? Yes. We saw probably about a 30% increase, and especially like with the ones that are in the house, because again, we continue to offer the meals and we continue to work with the faculty to say, you know, like um, uh, build a structure to where or routine of where they will see patients. And like I added extra support with the uh, mask and the N95s. And I mean, so they did not feel alone in this whole transition of, of the new normal. They always were supported. And I think they really appreciate it. And again, the attendance actually went up about 30%. Are there any clerkship coordinators on here that would want to share about, I mean, student education in that realm has changed drastically as well. Maybe everybody's a residency or fellowship, so. Uh, we, we have I, students here and for about three months, they couldn't rotate here. So we were on, um, we were on lockdown from anybody that didn't come here. So the students did kind of suffer for that a lot, having that, you know, hands-on kind of experience. They, cause we didn't, we could, you can't zoom patient care, but um, they did the ones that have come back that were here at the beginning of the COVID stuff that are now kind of finishing up their year that since we've let them back, it was a big adjustment for our students. So we actually have our students on OPD. Um, there is a telehealth system. And so they call the patient 20 minutes before the patient starts and they get the history and all of the chief complaints really about 30 minutes, then they report back to the attending and they join the call together and then they have a follow-up after. That's how we integrated OPD. 
They seemed to adjust really well, didn't they? Absolutely, and it's actually, it's been well received. Um, so inpatients suffered a little bit because it's mostly COVID services, but we maximized on the OPD. And Peggy, I'm a clerkship coordinator. Could you kind of repeat your question, what you wanted us to answer? I had just gotten off of a phone call when I heard you ask for coordinators. Oh, sure, Cheryl. Um, we were just talking about staying connected in the virtual world. Just wanted, you know, people to share, you know, insights, what worked, what didn't. If you had an aha moment, you know, with students, residents, fellows, even, you know, faculty, I found out has been a real um, challenge because they're at times they some of them are older and they've not adjusted to technology but so Cheryl I know you're very involved with your students so. yeah I'm actually here on site a lot and I came back mid-may we were we were gone for about six weeks with nobody allowed to come into work um, and the students were called off you know and uh, we couldn't start back until the June 1st rotation. And then they condensed our rotation from four weeks to three weeks, trying to catch up for the two missing months that the students went through. Um, they did kind of like virtual courses that they signed up for as two week, kind of like a branch elective uh, for them just so they can stay on target and not miss out on too much or miss too much time away. Um, and so when we came back, I had to hurry up and get a rotation ready for June 1st in two weeks time, uh, as opposed to a usual one month in advance, you know, getting all my ducks in a row. Uh, so things, they were off to a crazy start at first. Uh, then we got synchronized again into the three week rotation. And uh, some things had to fall by the wayside because of that. Um, just getting the most important things done for orientation. Uh, we have our didactic type uh, conferences on Wednesday mornings. Uh, we assign students to be speakers, uh, you know, to present a case that they've seen. And um, then usual Fridays, they would have another type of conference with the medical school staff. Uh, things were in place for that, for them to continue getting um, education type things from the med school. Um, I found that when I started doing orientation, we did it virtually. And we, the physician I work with, we just set it up for Mondays. And he said, just keep it open so that we didn't have to go in there and, and plug in every single different, you know, start of each rotation Monday. So I just left it open on Mondays from 10 eight to 10. And I found that some students were trying to contact me still. So I I uh, put my Zoom meeting open for every Monday morning. And uh, I call it my office hours now from eight to 10. And I might have some students coming or calling that way instead of coming to my desk in person and asking questions. Since uh, we either have a one week rotation that they can start or a two week um, site that they would work in. Um, and so of course, every Monday morning seemed to be question day. <laughs> uh, so I think that was working for that. I haven't had a lot of calls that way. Um, some still email me or call me on the phone. Um, and some of them are taking advantage of the, I'm calling it open office hours on Monday mornings. That's a great idea. So thank you everyone for just sharing that. Um, I wanted to open it up to, does anyone have any questions? Like, how did you handle this? Or, you know, maybe get some feedback from someone that maybe did it successfully? Or are you stuck somewhere with something? Uh, I actually have a question. Mostly, I think I, I think I might be the only Canadian on this call. So um, we're going through our, our matching right now where we're interviewing for or figuring out who we're going to interview for the next round of residents. Um, but we had a problem where um, we kept having hospital outbreaks. So I have 17 hospitals that I coordinate. 
um, for neurology and our medical students were having to be quarantined because they were on units that had been put on. So they had to quarantine for two weeks. Well, they're only, they're only doing one neurology elective for two weeks. So um, has anyone else been able to figure out a way to make sure that they still get some sort of neurology experience? Uh, or has, is this a, a, a me problem, not a you problem? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to tackle that? Do you have any type of telehealth capabilities at your institution? So, yes. Um, and actually, about 80% of our clinic, uh, outpatient clinics, are done by faculty um, through virtual means. But the, the, I think the problem is, is that a lot of them, they're, they're reluctant to take residents. So adding in medical students... Um, especially when they're supposed to be coming for an inpatient rotation as opposed to an outpatient rotation. Um, we usually save the outpatient stuff for the residents, not for the medical students. And, and I don't want them to fall by the wayside, even though I'm focusing most of my efforts on the, the residents. So, um. so Daniel, one of the things that we do is I've got a series. Um, one, of, one of the nice things that has happened during the pandemic is a lot of institutions and organizations have put um, a lot of their teaching materials online. And so I know the AAN has opened up their learning modules and I think CHOP has some good modules and there are some other institutions who have great teaching tools that are available. Mm. So when we do run into a situation where we have someone coming in and we can't find a telehealth and they can't go into the hospital, you know, um, AES even has some good modules. So, you know, sending it to them and saying, hey, you know, by the way, do this, this, and this, and, you know, make sure you send me your certificate to prove you did it. Um, I mean, that's always a last ditch effort to make sure they're getting some education and some uh, basic neurology stuff, but, you know, give, so giving them the access to those modules and a list of the ones that they should take care of um, has been helpful. It's a good idea. Do you guys use Canvas or MBOX for uh, material resources? Yeah, so we do everything like that as well, um, besides handing them out the most important documents, uh, four of them during orientation. We put everything else for their use and review into the Canvas uh, toolbox that we have. Um, and the other virtual things we're doing are the patient conference on Wednesdays in Grand Rounds. Um, otherwise, we have our students uh, conference. Yeah, I'll call it a conference <laughs> um, on Wednesday mornings first uh, before the other two. And then the Friday afternoon, those are in person. And uh, that's the way we're trying to do a combination of um, hybrid, I guess you'd call it, like kids going to school. <laughs> well, and one of the things that's funny, um, when for years we have been trying to coordinate um, our main, our major teaching hospitals, their rounds and teaching and whatnot to try to get like where we stream it from one site to the other so that, you know, if you're at Toronto Western, you can coordinate with Sunnybrook, you can coordinate with the different hospitals to be able to participate if you're on a neurology rotation. And we kept running into walls where people just couldn't do it. They weren't getting to it. And then COVID and lo and behold, it took like a week and everyone's all of a sudden now we we're posting on a Google doc. Th these are the things that are happening this week. These are the things here, are the links here, are the whatever. So I was mostly just sending them these kinds of um, these kinds of things to try to augment whatever they're not going to get in person. Um, but yeah, no, that, those are those are good ideas. Has anybody heard of Brain Pods or like a webinar series that you can? What we've done with our clerkship students who have had to quarantine and didn't have access to any um, on-hand experiences, this actually takes students through um, different scenarios. Um, you have actual neurologic exams. And key things to look at and we've kind of put them in order so as how they would learn them in the clinic setting um, as that extra layer of educational experience.
experience. Um, we also have a weekly case presentation with the clerkship director where he actually sits down with the students. He'll have a few interesting cases that he'll go through with them or he'll just go over, you know, any questions that they might have with them, giving them that one-on-one -on -one that maybe they wouldn't normally have in normal situations. Other questions? Thank you for all that. I hope that helped, Daniel. Well, I encourage you all to continue to reach out to each other um, through, um, Lucy, we have a listserv that they can subscribe to or part of. Yeah, we're trying to figure out it's not quite working the way we want it to. So we will figure out that I think we might want to look at if we need to create a synapse group for this for a consortium. So we're looking at that. So we also have um, the Facebook has been a good tool private group and I can send that out. I don't know the name of it across the top of my head, but that's been a great tool to share, you know, ask a question. What are you doing about this? Does anybody have this? Um, and there's actually, don't forget, there's a document section in there where you can share files. I see that on the um, GME coordinators. They've done a great job of sharing documents, but, um, you know, encourage everyone to use each other. I think Adam just put in a, um, a great link there, learning.aan.com for, for that. Um, sometimes you feel like we're at an island when you're the only one at your institution doing, you know, neuro. So um, reach out to each other and I encourage you to um, share information or ask that question. Adam, I'm just wondering for the link that you sent, I clicked on it, but it's not, it's saying it can't be found. Is that the correct link? I don't know, let me check. I, it may have gone into Zoom a little incorrectly. Huh, I was just on it earlier today. All right, if anyone, we don't have any more Q&A. Oh, thank you, Adam. That looks like a, a good link. Um, the next topic we're going to talk about is um, residency slash um, fellowship recruitment. And I have two, did I, you did you guys volunteer to be sort of uh, <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> drag you into that. So we have Laura. Um, Gwen is from the University of Michigan, and Nicolasa. I always say your name wrong. I'm sorry, and I've met you a million times. Is from uh, Kaiser Permanente, and they're going to share a little bit about what worked or what didn't work. So you guys go ahead and take it away. Before we jump in, I know the way we structured the agenda is um, if clerkship coordinators more than welcome to stay on, but just, you know, in the interest of their time, if they wanted to um, take off, certainly can. But just wanted to mention before they leave, if they're, if they will leave, when our next meetings are and, you know, we're looking to create those agendas. So if folks have um, topics they definitely want to hear about, just send them our way and we'll work with Peggy and Chris to, you know, uh, create the agenda, but um, look for, you know, emails for our March and May meetings. As I mentioned, we have the April one schedule, which is part of the annual meeting, you know, uh, programming, but um, look for, for those emails coming up here um, in the next week or so. Um, so uh, we just wanted to make you aware and, and put the uh, call out for agenda items. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, my name is Laura Gwynn. I am the residency coordinator for the Department of Neurology at the University of Michigan. Um, Peggy, thank you for reaching out to see if we could find people to do this. Um, we just finished our interviews for the season. Uh, we interviewed about 100 people. Uh, we did kind of a combination between using Thalamus and Zoom. Uh, we were lucky enough to get Thalamus this year and I'm very grateful that we did it. It turned out really well for us. Um, I felt that we had a good virtual season. I think in the beginning, it was a little bit rough for everybody, not just one side or the other. You know, everybody was a little unfamiliar with how it was gonna go, what it was gonna be like. Um, you know, I think everybody was 
open-minded to doing whatever we could to make sure that everything was going to run smooth. So that was really nice uh, for our area. Um, you know, we tried our best to make sure we included all the things that we could without getting that in-person experience, um, you know, virtual tours, making sure they had uh, the right faculty to meet and all those kinds of things. Um, we did send out like a two question survey at the end of the interview, just asking what they liked about the interview and what they did not, just so that we could adjust the rest of our interview season uh, to make sure that we were you know, capturing the things that were going good and not going good with recruitment season. Um, that is just a little bit of how ours went so far. I don't know if Nicolessa has something different than me, but you know, we're welcome to open it up. Yeah, so I think for us, what we did, um, first we needed to determine what was the most important factor we were trying to accomplish, and that was a virtual connection. Obviously, you don't have that in-person relationship with the candidates, and since they were essentially not auditioning, or if you will, for their clerkship at Kaiser Permanente, uh, we wanted to establish that. So the most, I think we had to, I will say, we probably gave more information than we normally would um, by drafting a very, very detailed interview kind of, if you will, letter that covered expectations, what to expect, contacts. We essentially did much more than we wanted to do because we wanted the candidates to come in without any sort of, um, um, to kind of get that relationship that is virtual, but would mimic in-person, if that makes sense. So we did a lot of that. Um, I would say also, just like Laura said, things went really, really good. We did the same um, survey. We get, um, gave them a survey at each um, after each um, interview, and uh, we got a lot of positive feedback. Now, I don't know how much we can say that's 100% because a lot of times they tend not to want to fill that because they think that it might tarnish their possibility of getting that match, so we do understand that. But the few that we um, received were very positive. Um, so, yeah, so I think I'm kind of in the same place that... Um, Laura, so I don't know if you guys have any questions on how to tackle things or what you did, but since it's an open conversation, I guess we'll kind of have it um, get to us that. Hi, I'm Mary Fallon from SUNY Upstate on vacation today, so excuse how I look. Um, we did a, a virtual um, open house. There was a Twitter that my residents found. And so we did two of those before interview season. And then I kept track of the people that went to the open house and how many of them interviewed with us, which was interesting, probably about 50%. Um, we interviewed 124 people. And uh, I created a document, a Sway document. I don't know if anybody else has done it. It's in Microsoft Office. Um, with all of our, like you said, so much more information than they'd ever need to know, soup to nuts about our program, our faculty, the area, and I included it with the invitation to interview, and I've got more compliments on that than anything else, because like you said, it gave them everything they needed. I really feel we did more than we would do in person. Um, I liked how it went, and I think now that we have all the tools created, it's definitely um, the way to go. I think the candidates love it. They can interview from anywhere. It doesn't cost anything. Um, I do feel it was a lot more time for us and um, <laughs> tracking and making sure they get the documents in. Um, you know, I tried to get them in before they interview. So I'm, uh, we interviewed on Mondays and Tuesdays, eight people each day, uh, two sessions, four uh, in each session with four faculty. And I ended up like on Friday night, reminding them on Saturday, reminding them on Sunday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was a lot of effort, um, but I think it went really well. So, um, and that's what we did. We also had at the end of their interview, uh, they could come back and talk to a resident for an hour, just one-on-one -on -one with a resident. That way, if they had any questions uh, from their interview, they uh, have a resident to talk to directly. So, just that a few things that we, I would say, I guess a lot of the candidates thought that was really a good idea because that was the majority of, um, if you will, thumbs up kind of thing is that since we knew that they were not able to come to the medical center, we actually created a, I wouldn't say very extensive, but we created a pretty good bio, which included all the, um, all the attendings that were going to interview the um, applicants and all the residents. And that way it kind of gave them a little bit of connection of, oh, so this person went to this medical school. This is why they chose Casa Permanente. 
um, you know, we asked a few Q&A questions in that bio so that that way when they actually met the resident during the social, which we actually still kept the social even though it was uh, virtual, kind of establish a little bit of a relationship on, um, you know, um, in the beginning of it. And then we also utilized, I mean, I don't know, Laura, if you did this, but we definitely implemented the resident lounge that was simultaneous why the um, interview session was going on. So those two factors, a lot of candidates really, really appreciated. So that's just a little tidbit from our end. Yeah, we did, we did a uh, night before dinner with the or virtual dinner with the residents and all the applicants. And they, you know, they did like a little bit of an overview of what the residents do in a day to day, you know, thing during their time there. And then they each had um, because we had 10 applicants and usually between seven and eight um, residents, we, we paired them into rooms of like two residents and two or three applicants. And then they got to talk individually and then switch out and you know, talk with different residents and ask different questions. Um, we we a, did a, this is Mary. I just wanted to say we did a meet and greet too. We didn't do a night before because we just thought with 16 sessions and doing the night before is a lot for our residents. So what we did is we talked to our chiefs and they did 10 meet and greet and tours separate from the interview day, um, usually the same week and ended up doing about six of them. And they went over really well. And almost every single candidate that interviewed with us went to one of those. And then we did the same thing where we paired them off so that if there were 20 people and six residents, you know, each resident took four people. Um, so that's how we handled uh, them being able to talk to the residents separately. We pretty much structured everything the same way as we normally do with interviews. They had the mm -hmm. social before um, the interview day with the residents and the social com was consisted of um, an informal, they downloaded like a neural psych app and they played a game and then they had the breakout rooms where they could do the one-on-one -on -one with the residents. And then a day of interviews, I did like an overview with them to kind of get them acclimated to like, hey, if your internet shuts down, this is what happens. If, if we lose a connection, this is what happens. And I think that was very comforting to them. And then prior to, I attached our MUIC brochure, our applicant information. Um, and during the course of interviews, they would have like a virtual breakout where they had lunch with the residents, all of our residents. And then they also had um, a virtual tour. And even though we could not, you know, they couldn't come to campus, they were able to see Charleston, they were able to see, you know, exactly where the residents are. And I think they found that very, very beneficial. I, we got a lot of positive feedback about that. So we try and kept it, kept, try and relieve some of the stress that the applicants have by letting them know again that they had the support that they needed at the institution and, and also uh, communicating prior to interviews as much information as possible. We did a lot of updating of our websites as well and mm -hmm. Instagram and Twitters and Facebook. Wanted mm -hmm. to make sure everything was current. Wasn't it amazing how quick we got up to speed on social media? <laughs> it was like light speed, but it took a village too. Our residents took over Twitter and I had already built a Wix website and, and was using that, but it, and the residents took care of the, um, the tour, the interesting video that they did. So um, it, it took a village, it really did. So did anyone change what they did because we had, I mean, I, everybody I would take had so many more candidates because they weren't coming on site. Did anyone change what they did or did you interview more people? We actually interviewed more. Yeah. Can you, oh, yeah, we already, um, we actually interviewed more people than normal um, just because of that. And it was one thing that actually my program director did, which I can't take credit for. He actually drove around the area of the hospital um, and kind of had his daughter drive and then he videoed because we live in Cleveland and it's not, it's not like no one's excited. Oh, I'm going to Cleveland, you know? So, um, so it was really good. So he just drove along from like the nearby neighborhoods to around the hospital and sort of like as he would drive in so that people can get an idea of what Cleveland is like and, um, and the hospital area. I thought that was a really good idea. Um, but yeah, we did interview more people as well. And we used Thalamus, which made it so much easier. I have a question. Um, 
question that anyone have a panel interview we didn't but i'm just curious to know what the feedback was if anyone had a virtual panel interview no okay we actually um what happened differently for us this year was that we broke it down into we, we interviewed the same amount of people um but we have uh an apd that is like a stats magician like he 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 took all of their paper interviews and 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 gave them a point system based on that and based and it was blind like we you know we we had no idea who they were other than just their application and um, we invited them based on the paper criteria and that got funneled into their interview criteria so we had never really done that before it was basically just you know uh you know oh they look good you know we're going to invite them and you know, if, if they showed the impetus to, come <clears throat> to Charlottesville, then, you know, hey, they're interested, you know, but uh, being a virtual, uh, a virtual environment, it's so hard to know if you're, if, if the applicant is really interested in being there or whether it's just easy for them to just apply like, you know, like a, like a barn shot, just, sh you know, just as many interviews as possible. So that was really, really new for us uh, to really take a deep dive into the statistical uh, you know, just trying to see who the best applicants for us would be. So that was new. That's a hard one when you're not, for us, you know, not everybody wants to come to Tucson and trying to figure out who's real and who's not. I did a session with, we, we did a couple of virtual open houses and then I took those names and I uh, invited them to what about interview season from a coordinator's perspective. So I did my own little like open house and then our university actually last night did a um, diversity uh, sort of second look with, with I guess from all any different, any program could come. And I think we had a really good response to um, still trying to, you know, stay in front of them who see who's really interested sort of thing. One thing, uh, we were surprised about it, Emery. We didn't. It didn't seem like this year anybody got interview fatigue. Usually, the last couple of weeks we have a lot of people to cancel, and we can get through our wait list and offer interviews to people that we couldn't initially offer them to. And we didn't have that this year. It was like everybody was very excited to interview. We added on two extra days of interviews, so 24 extra people got to interview this year than normal. And and it was a busy season. It was really, really busy. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to have to agree with that. Uh, we ended up adding three more days for that same reason. Usually towards the end of our, the last three or four interview days, we usually have two or three a day that kind of trickle off and then we get to invite and we just didn't have that this year. And so we ended up tacking on three more days after because of it. I mean, it was nice and we got a great we it was it was hard doing our ranks this year so it was it was good anyone else we're closing in on our time because we don't want to keep over here well just i think we real quick, go ahead andy I, just, I was just curious if anybody is aware of this uh reddit spreadsheet does anybody know about the reddit spreadsheet Okay, well, I will put a link in there. It's basically instead of um, it's basically the applicants, not all of the applicants, obviously, but the ones that want to participate are giving impressions of the interview season. So I don't know if anybody's aware of this. It's enlightening. Um, it's also it, it could be heartbreaking. I don't know if you want to see it or not, but um, I, I'll, I'll put that in the in the in the chat here. It's. <laughs> It's up to you guys. I don't. I don't want to. No, that's great. I I saw one last year and I was surprised. Um, I had to yell at one of my faculty for. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the big thing is their discussions you know, that wasn't listed. Yeah, the, the, the big thing is not to get involved in it. You know, it's you can look at it, but I don't think it benefits anybody to participate in it. You know what I mean? So, because um, because you would lose perspective if you know you went in and started messing with their their information. So. Well, thank you, everyone. That was, I think the dialogue will continue on all of this. I think we learned a lot this year. Um, I, 
I could see interview season staying virtual. I know there was a program out of Phoenix that's been doing it for a couple of years, I think an IM program. So um, I kind of see, you know, it going that that way. Um, and um, I, I really appreciate all of you guys just connecting and sharing. I mean, we just, like I said, we just learn from, from one another. Um, if you have any ideas, as Lucy said, for topics, or if you'd like to present on a topic or discussion, you know, we'd like to make these sessions very interactive. Um, just, you know, let Lucy know, let myself know, or Chris Berry know. And, and we want to include clerkship, fellowship, and residency. It's not all, all about one. And even, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see people from, from the PEED side of the world, Neuro, to join us as well, that that's um, really, really important that we, we're, we're in this together, right? Um, so um, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes back and there will be a recording. We will um, we'll send it out and the slides, um, Lucy, we'll, we'll circulate the, the slides as well. Yep, we will send the slides. The recording will take a little, about a week to get out. We just have to edit it and that sort of stuff. But once it's available, we'll send it out. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. And stay warm and safe if you're somewhere cold. And uh, um, we'll see you guys in a few more weeks.